In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to fall on you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. Those whose faith is focused on God, who find their security in Him, do not have to live in fear. We are not left untouched by the tempest of this life, and we may be wounded by the onslaughts of evil, but God does not leave us to suffer these things alone. The Lord cares for His own and delivers us even in the midst of the conflicts that plague us. O oh Lord, we admit our failings, we confess to you our sins. Much of which threatens and brings us low is our own fault. For this we beg your forgiveness for the sake of our Savior Jesus. Please grant us your pardon and peace. Let your ministering spirits watch over us and give us the ultimate victory in Christ. Our loving God has promised it. Because my child loves me, I will never let him go. I shall feel the pain of his wounds and bear his hurt, and shall transform that which is ugly into that which enriches and blessings. When he cries out in agony, I shall hear and answer him. I will be close to him and will deliver him, and I will grant him eternal life. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
reading for today is from Romans 6, 1 to 11. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death, death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of our Lord. Please stand for the gospel. Our gospel reading for today comes from John 12, 20 to 26. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bathsheba in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. 
Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into this earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servants be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Will the children please come forward? Good morning. Do you see the picture up there on the screen? What are all of the children doing? And they all have a big... Let me see it. Let me see. I want to see the big smile. There it is. That's perfect. Now, Sunday morning, for a lot of people, is a day to sleep in. You don't have to get up and go to school. You don't have to get up and go to work. So you just stay in bed all morning. But you're different. Why are you different? Because you're awake. You're not asleep. You're awake. I can see all of your eyes. You're all awake. And you're here. So why are you different? Why are you awake and why are you here? Well, we have some things in church to remind you of why you are different. You see up on the altar, you see that tall thing up there? What do we call that? We call that a cross. Now, we have a cross right there in the center for everybody to see. Everybody that's out there, if they look forward, what's the first thing they're going to see up there? They're going to see the cross. It's right at the focal point. It draws your attention. And that's to remind us the reason we're not home in bed, the reason we're awake, the reason we're sitting here in the pew today is because of what happened on that cross a long time ago. God's Son, our Savior Jesus, was crucified and died on a cross, one made out of wood that was very tall. It was a terrible, painful death that he didn't deserve, but he did it for us to take all of our sins away. And so we're awake we're here, we're sitting in the pew, we're looking at the cross and we're remembering Jesus who loves us and takes all of our sins away. And there's something else over here. See right over here? We call that a baptismal font. And we have usually very small children brought by their parents. And we say in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, with God's promise and God's power, our sins are washed away and we're made children of God. And what do children of God do on Sunday morning? They don't stay home in bed. They get up and they wake up and they come to church and they sit into the, in the pew and they look at the cross and they remember they're baptized and they listen to God's word. God's word that says, I love you, each and every one of you, and I take all of your sins away and I want you to be my children forever. And I want you to tell everyone that I want everyone to be my children. And you can tell them in words, but you could also show them by loving them like brothers and sisters. So I'm glad that you're awake and that you're here today. And remember when you wake up to thank God who gave you life and who gave you Jesus. In his name, Two, three, four.
What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness, my freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley, He will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. I tread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus fled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, my chains are released, I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know He will renew me Until I stand with joy before the throne To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus All the glory evermore to Him When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat Yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, And they said to him, He said to them, One of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. John looked at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And then two of John's disciples followed Jesus. One was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, and the other is presumed to have been Philip, 
who was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Simon and Andrew. And what is the first thing that Philip did after he followed Jesus? Philip found Nathanael and said to him, Nathanael said to him, Philip said to him, Come and see. According to tradition, Philip ministered later in Turkey, Tunisia, and northern Africa and was martyred by stoning in A.D. 54. But John 12, 20-22 gives us some insight into Philip. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. This tells us something about Philip because these Greeks sought Philip out because apparently he was open to speaking to Gentiles. And he had maintained his friendship with Andrew, and together they took the matter to Jesus. Although Andrew was a follower of John the Baptizer, he continued his trade as a fisherman. Philip is being depicted in The Chosen as a full-time disciple of John and seems very different from all of the other disciples that Jesus has called so far. Philip is more relaxed. He's more confident. He's friendly towards Matthew. He's less judgmental. He's less argumentative. He's confident to ask Jesus about his friend. And he's interested in creating unity among the disciples. Perhaps this is a result of his experience in following John. I want you to consider what Paul has to say about pastors in 1 Timothy 3. The saying is trustworthy. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? And so we see portrayed in the chosen, the recent converts, the ones recently called to Jesus, often will have pride get in the way, and they will squabble among themselves as to who is going to be the greatest, who's going to be the leader of the apostles. Now, no matter how young a man is when he finishes seminary and takes his first call as a pastor, there are different approaches that these men take to the task. Some are very hesitant and they tremble at the responsibility. Others may be overconfident and seek to mold a congregation into their own image, and they fall anywhere in between. Walter A. Meyer II, that's the one in color, son of the famed first Lutheran hour speaker, Walter A. Meyer, that's the one in black and white. Walter A. Meyer II was one of my favorite profs at the seminary and he was affectionately known by his initials, WHAM, because when you took his class, that's exactly what it was like. When he lectured on Romans, the words just poured out of him, nonstop for the entire class. It was impossible to keep up trying to take notes. So someone tape recorded his lectures, had them typed out, made mimeograph copies. Now raise your hand if you know what a mimeograph is. That's the old-fashioned copy machine, okay? Made mimeograph copies and then sold them on the seminary black market. <laughs> yes, we did have a black market. And everyone in class had a copy. So we could just sit and we could listen and we could follow along in the notes and he got every word exactly as it was written. One of the things that he said 
that stuck with me all of these years was how important it was to elevate the congregation to the level of the scripture. He said, the pastor should never try to dumb down the message. He should never try to maintain an aura of spiritual superiority, but patiently elevate the saints so that they are mighty in the scriptures. In The Chosen, we see the disciples squabbling over who is in charge, fighting over who is going to be greatest among them. They're unsure of what their role is in this kingdom of heaven that Jesus is proclaiming. There are jealousies, there's a lack of understanding, there's a lack of forgiveness. And then Philip is introduced, an experienced follower of Jesus, an experienced follower of John, who now is a follower of Jesus, and he can see all of these things. And like a mature disciple, he seeks to smooth things out. Now, it's obvious. Simon is still having a great deal of trouble accepting Matthew, the hated tax collector. So what does Philip do? He immediately befriends Matthew, and he tries to help him to fit in with the others. Matthew indicates that he's always, his entire life, felt like an outsider. Many, mostly because of the choices that he's made in his life. And Philip says to him, the people out there, they want to define us by our past, our sins. Matthew is confused and replies, out there, where? Philip says, with the sleepers. But we're different. We're awake. It doesn't matter what we did before we became followers of Jesus. The time that we were on the outside, that we were not part of the kingdom of God, wasn't wasted. God uses those life experience, experiences to shape us into the people that he wants us to be. C.S. Lewis spent a lot of his life denying God. When he was dragged, he said, kicking and screaming into the kingdom of God, he used all of his life experiences to become one of the great defenders of the faith. I spent most of my childhood outside the faith. By the time I was in high school, I was a self-proclaimed atheist. I considered Christianity a crutch for weak people. But God used that part of my life to humble me and help me to understand other people who feel that way. I was extremely shy and withdrawn. I was comfortable only with my best friends. But then an English teacher encouraged me to try out for a play. And I got the part of the old fool. I know you're thinking typecasting, but back then I was, I was a young fool. I got the part of the old fool, Lord Edgar, in a French farce. And I began the play sitting on a bench, safely behind a newspaper so that nobody could see me. And I was shaking like a leaf, wondering if I would be able to put the paper down and deliver my first line. I did, and I managed fine after that. God used those experiences in my life so that by the time I got to the seminary and I took preaching class, I could stand up in front of my fellow students and I could preach to them, and I could look them in the eye, and I wasn't afraid, I wasn't terrified of public speaking because of those experiences before I knew that I was going to become a follower of Jesus. Who knew back then that God had chosen me and he was preparing me for the life he had in store? Philip encouraged his friend Nathaniel, who is depicted in The Chosen, thinks his life has ended because he lost his dream job. He can't be an architect. He helps him to see that God has chosen him to build the kingdom of heaven. We're different. We're not defined by our past. We're not defined by our sins. We read earlier in Romans, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death?
For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin. We're different because we have been chosen by Jesus. We're not sleepers. We're awake. We're not spiritually dead. We're alive. We don't hold grudges. We forgive as we have been forgiven. We're not jealous of others, but we have learned contentment with godliness. We're not controlled by our fallen sinful nature. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. We can love God wholeheartedly and repent when we fall short. We can love our neighbor and spread the love of Christ. When Philip learned what Jesus is planning to do, he wonders out loud if John and Jesus have a death wish. Jesus says, I wouldn't exactly call it a wish, but Jesus knows who he is, and he knows exactly what he came here to do. And he's proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. He's strengthening the weak and he's healing the ill. He's demonstrating his authority through signs and wonders that people might believe his words and believe in him as the Savior. He knows how it will all end, and soon he will begin to speak of it. As I watch each episode of The Chosen, it's wonderful to see the excitement of the early years of Jesus' ministry being portrayed. It must have been amazing. And you can understand why the disciples wanted it to continue like this forever. The words he spoke with the authority and power of God, the miracles that he performed, just being with Jesus. And he was preparing them for what they had to do after he had done what he came to do. He will suffer and die and rise again and ascend to the Father and send the Holy Spirit and then they, the chosen, will go to the ends of the earth to proclaim the good news of Jesus, the Savior, Jesus of Nazareth. And yes, something good can come from Nazareth. In fact, the best thing that happened since God had created all things good, in the words of Philip, just come and see. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your gracious mercy to us. You've loved us with an everlasting love. You sent your son Jesus to be our savior. You've called us, you've chosen us to follow you, to be alive, to be awake. And we pray that you would enable us by the spirit given to us, by the spirit living within us, to live as people who are awake, who are not defined by our past, by our sins, but who are defined by the love of Jesus that rules our hearts and our lives. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, you tell us to bring all of our requests to you with thanksgiving. You will hear and answer according to what is best. We pray for all of those who are suffering from cancer. Sue, Kurt, Arla, Mont, Robin, Linda, Debbie, Steve, Margie, Dan, Helen, Lori, Roxy, Casey and Rachel.
We pray, O oh Lord, that you would work your healing touch in all of them, but help them to know that nothing, no illness, not even death, can separate them from your love in Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for all of those who are suffering from COVID and recovering from COVID right now. We thank you that many of the members of our congregation have recovered and are well enough to be back with us today, but there are others still recovering at home. We think especially of Jordan, and we pray that you would help us all, O oh Lord, to continue to be healthy in Jesus' name. We pray that you would continue to be with Dr. Bob and Sue, and Terry, Lois, Nick, Dave, Ron, Bill, Norma, Katrina, Ryan, Mary, Lisa, Diana, Joan, Mary, and Debbie, and with Luke, who was attacked by a dog this week. We pray that you would grant them strength for recovery. Lord, in your mercy. We pray that you would continue to be with Eleanor as she awaits the result of tests, and we pray that they're posit not positive, but good. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for Jonathan, who will be undergoing surgery this coming Thursday. We pray your healing touch. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for Chris, who had melanoma surgery this last week, and we pray that he will be clear of cancer. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for expectant mothers Samantha and Elisha and their children, that they would be safely delivered. Lord, in your mercy. We pray your care for Remy and Deanne and your protection for baby Ledger. Lord, in your mercy. Grant your wisdom and protection for all parents, grandparents, and children. Grant your protection for all students and teachers. We pray that you would be with all missionaries all over the world who are spreading the good news of Jesus. Especially, we think of Luke and Ruth and the Seabolds and all others. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are battling against depression, anxiety, or addictions, that you would grant them victory, that you would grant strength and peace and consolation to those who are grieving loved ones. We pray your strength for caregivers, your protection for those who are traveling. We pray your strength and wisdom for those who teach and preach your word. We pray for the hurting and the lost who need to know Jesus. We pray for all of those serving in the armed forces that you would keep them safe, return them to their families, and help them do their jobs to their, the best of their ability and to your glory. We pray this also for all first responders, for those in law enforcement, for those who drive ab ambulances, for those who put out fires, for those who are serving at emergency rooms. Help them to do their best. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for our nation and for all the nations of the world that you would grant peace, an end to war, an end to violence, an end to terrorism, and an end to division, enmity, and hatred, that we might learn to love one another, and if we can't love one another, to simply get along for the common good. Oh Lord, you call us to strive for peace, to do everything within our power to live peacefully with all people. Help us to do that. We pray in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please remain standing. Three counts. One, two, three. For 
the cause of Christ the King, we give our lives an offering, till all the earth resounds with ceaseless praise to the sun. For the cause of Christ we go, with joy to reap, with faith to sow, as many see, and many put their trust in the sun. Christ we proclaim, the name above every name, for all creation, every nation, God's salvation through the sun. For the King once lifted high, to cries of rage, of crucify, endured the cross as every sin was laid on the sun. The king who conquered death to free the poor and the oppressed for lasting peace, for life and liberty in the sun. Christ we proclaim the name above every name for all creation, every nation, God's salvation through the sun. Let it be my life's refrain to live as Christ, to die as Cain, deny myself, take up my cross and follow the sun. Let it be my life's refrain to live as Christ, to die as Cain, Deny myself, take up my cross and follow the sun. Christ we proclaim, the name above every name. For all creation, every nation, God's salvation through the sun. Thank you so much for being here to worship with us today. Do we have any guests to be introduced? From? Well, congratulations. <laughs> it's a little warmer down there, especially in the months to come. Being from Chicago, I know. Any other guests with us today? I see some people lining up for announcements. Uh, who's first? Probably go around this way. Safer. Don't knock my new guitar over. <laughs> okay, we are offering uh, children's Sunday school for the fall. Um, all the kiddos will stay in the fellowship hall to watch the chosen and then are welcome to join Erica and Miss Debbie in the youth room for a short lesson. Um, let's see, the, uh, the pancake uh, brunch. So on September 11th, there's going to be uh, a pancake brunch following an outdoor service, hopefully outdoors. And um, if you'd like to bring something, there's a board to sign up for that um, back there and um, Ray and Jan are doing that. So uh, you can speak with them if you'd like to help the day of. Thank you. Judy? On September the 17th, LWML will, at our church will support and host the zone, which means churches from Rensselaer, well, and um, all from Rensselaer to here will be coming. So I could use some help with getting ready and also at the day of, but I especially hope many women and will come to help support LDML, which supports missions. I want to thank Jan and Ray for volunteering to help with the food. So that's the biggest thing. So we'll just need some help with registration guiding people up here. Pastor will be doing the Bible study. 
Carissa is going to do Stephen ministry, so it's a lot of in-house. And Barb's quilt group will have a few quilts to show what our church is doing. So please come. Let me know um, before September the 10th that you're going to be coming. Um, and if you don't want to do work, that's fine. We just need people here. Thank you. So by Bible study, you mean the opening devotion? Yes. Okay. Good. We're on. All right. And it's not just me. Uh, the band will be up here leading the opening devotion and worship as well. Yeah, I didn't know how many will be here, too. Uh, September the 18th, I hope to have another um, loud El Mites collection. I'll have a tin thing, so if you have change on the 18th, it'll go to a very good cause. All right, we still have those buckets from last time. Okay. Great. Thank you. Caleb? All right, so we are uh, less than three weeks away from our uh, back to school bash. Uh, we've got uh, three bands uh, coming for that. Uh, so I'm uh, pretty excited about that. Um, I do need a couple of volunteers uh, to help uh, with the merchandise tables and everything while the bands are playing. Uh, so if that's something you'd be interested in, uh, let me know. Um, there's some posters in the back, so if you think uh, there's a place to hang them up or just somebody you want to give one to, uh, feel free to do that. Thanks. So we'll begin episode two of the second season of The Chosen, and it focuses on Philip and Nathaniel. Now, who knows Nathaniel's other name from the New Testament? Nathaniel is also Bartholomew. So next Sunday, Richard Bartholomew will do the preaching about Bartholomew. And I'm sure he's been waiting his entire life to do this. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, so we'll meet downstairs and we'll get started probably in about 20 minutes or so and watch the first half of the episode. And there was something else I wanted to say, but now I've forgotten it. Uh, yes, the update on that concert is there's no update. It's, the concert's definitely off. The Long Center just will not participate. But we asked about them doing a hymn sing. We've heard absolutely nothing back from them, so my assumption is that that's off. And maybe we'll try again in the future. And uh, once we know for sure, we'll let everybody know for sure that it's, it's a no-go. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. 